Amen. All right, well, we're here in John chapter 6, and the title of my sermon this morning is A Hard Pill to Swallow. A Hard Pill to Swallow. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this wonderful day. God, I just pray that you'd help me to preach and uh, fill me with the Holy Spirit as I preach now. And uh, Lord, just give me power and boldness, and I pray that uh, the people would have ears to hear today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, a hard pill to swallow. I, I've been noticing these memes on Facebook, and it'll, say, it'll have like a picture of a person's hand, and it'll say a hard pill to swallow, and it'll have like some saying underneath it. Oh, you guys know what I'm talking about? Okay. So, that's kind of what I was just thinking about. A lot of the things in the Bible are hard pills for people to swallow. They're hard sayings. And, and in this chapter, in John chapter 6, you see that Jesus is talking about, you know, if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, then you don't have life abiding in you, basically. He's just saying, you know, and, and what he's saying is he's saying literally to eat his flesh and drink his blood. No, it, th these things are spiritual things that he's talking about. But people are just like, how can we do this? How can we eat his flesh and drink his blood? Because they didn't understand what he was trying to say. And so there's many things in the Bible and the Word of God that are hard pills to swallow. And some things are harder for us to swallow than others. Sometimes when our sin gets touched, touched upon, you know, those are things that are hard pills for us to swallow. And, you know, we just got to be willing to accept what the Bible says. We got to be willing to accept it no matter how hard of a pill it is to swallow. And because, look, God is not a liar, right? God is incapable of lying. It's an immutable fact in the Bible that God cannot lie, right? So we need to understand this morning, and this is what the sermon's about, is that even if it's a hard pill to swallow, we need to learn to swallow it. Get some water, buddy, because you're going to have, a, you know, you know what I'm talking about, those big pills? Have you ever taken a big pill, you know, and it's just like, you know, have you ever gotten a, a big pill caught in your throat and you're like, <laughs> you know? Because you didn't have enough water, or you thought you could just swallow it with your own spit or whatever. <laughs> that never works. You know, on those big horse pills. One time my grandma, she was like, I, was, I said, Grandma, I think I'm starting to get sick. And so she just like loads all these vitamins in my hand. Like, it was literally a gigantic pile of vitamins. And some of them were like these green, you know, I don't know what they were, but I called them horse pills, because that's kind of what they were like. And so she said, no, you got to take them all at the same time. And so, like, I literally just put all these pills in my mouth, and I, and I swallowed them. I was choking, and and then, like, I puked, like, 20 minutes later because she just overloaded me. She was trying to help me, but those were some hard pills to swallow. <laughs> so, but uh, what does it mean? Like, I just kind of Googled what a hard pill to swallow means, and it means this. It means something difficult to accept or understand. And so what is Jesus in this chapter? He's telling them things that are difficult for them to accept and difficult for them to understand. And so, what are some things, I'm just gonna, before we get moving into the sermon, I wanna, I wanna share some of the memes that I found on, on, uh, online, okay? Pills that are hard to swallow. Big Pharma isn't looking for cures, they're looking for repeat customers. That's a hard pill for some people to swallow. Because, you know, and it's funny because it's talking about pills, right? But it's, it's, it's true, I mean, the hospitals aren't really, trying to make people better necessarily they're trying to give you more drugs they're trying to sell you more drugs to keep you alive right now obviously that's not always the case i mean uh you know sometimes they do, they want to help you all right okay i'm not saying that hospitals are evil or anything like that but but the pharmacy companies you know they, they can be pretty wicked right selling like 600 hundred dollar pills and things like that it's just ridiculous but here's another hard pill to swallow girls actually love nice guys but you're probably not as nice as you think you are. That's a hard pill for some guys to swallow, right? They think they're the nice guy, but in reality, they're really not. Here's another one. There are only two genders. That's a hard pill for some people to swallow, especially in this area. Eating organic might still leave you dead by 70. That's a hard pill for some people to swallow. How about garlic drops aren't the, aren't the wonder drug cure? Hard pill to swallow for some people. Oh, God, just put the garlic drops in your ears. Look, garlic drops are not a miracle snake oil, <laughs> sna snake oil cure for everything, okay? Anyway, it's getting a little quiet in here. But uh, here's a hard pill for me to swallow. The Blazers will never win a championship again. <laughs> here's another one. The Ducks will never win a national cha college football championship game. 
Smoking weed every day is drug addiction. That's a hard pill for some people to swallow. What do you mean? What, cannabis is you know, made by God. It's made by the earth and blah, 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 blah. Look, if you're smoking it every day, the time you wake up to the time you go to bed, you're addicted. It's an addiction. And it's also a gateway drug. What about some others? Is there, any, is there anything that anybody else could think of that would be a hard pill for someone to swallow? It could be anything. Anybody? Think, make sure it's a good one, though. <laughs> Any guys? Come on. No? <laughs> yeah. Women should be wearing skirts only. Hard pill for ladies to swallow, right? Yeah. If they all say something different, they can't all be the same. If the Bibles all say something different, they can't all be the same. That's a hard pill for people to swallow. I was looking at our uh, Google reviews last night. And somebody had gone to somebody's door in this area, and he's like, this is the Stephen Anderson cult in this area. And although I appreciate people going door to door, then he just runs us down. And uh, yeah, he goes, and the fact that they're not, uh, that they promote this King James only thing. Well, what do you promote? That, you know, that you don't have the whole word of God because you're using the NIV? I mean, these people that don't believe the King, the, the King James only is perfect. Well, which one is? Right. You tell me the one that is, and I'll show you some mistakes in it. Um, any, anybody got anything else? Jesus is, the only way. Jesus is the only way to heaven. That's a hard pill for some people to swallow, isn't it? Yeah, because they think that, you know, all roads lead to heaven. You know, all roads might lead to Rome, but they don't all re lead to heaven. <laughs> anybody got any other ones? Yeah. Salvation by faith alone. That's a hard pill for people to swallow. Me and Brother Scott were, I was with Scott Dunn yesterday, and he says hello, by the way, to everybody. But I was out with him, and uh, he knocked on the store, and this lady was Catholic. And she goes, you know, he said, well, what do you think it takes to get to heaven? She's like, oh, just be a good person and do good works and blah, 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 blah. And so he just shows her, you know, the truth. And she goes, well, you know, I, I'm just going to stick with what, I, what I've been taught and blah, 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 right? So basically, she, it was a hard pill for her to swallow. She couldn't swallow the fact that salvation is by faith alone and that it's eternal life. She thought that, you know, if I'm good enough that God's going to judge me and then I might get to go to heaven. What a sad way to live your life. What a sad way to, to think about life. I mean, constantly in fear that you're not good enough to go to heaven. I mean, that's, 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 it's scary. It's a, I don't understand why people would want to stay in that. Right. It's like they just like living on a balancing beam all the time. You know those trapeze people and they're, you know, they're walking on the tight ropes in the circus? Who's ever been to the circus before? I'm not talking about your house. I'm talking about the circus, you know, where they have the big house, right? But uh, trapeze artists, you know, they're always walking on a tight rope and people are, ah, oh, scared. That's what people that want to live by their works live like. Any moment they could just fall and lose their salvation. It's a scary way to live. So let's look at our text in John chapter 6. Let's look at verse number 30. The Bible says, They said therefore unto him, What signs showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? Our fathers did eat man in the desert, and it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. So what is he talking about? He's talking about the manna that God provided for the children of Israel before they went into the promised land. Every morning they would go and pick up this manna and they would make bread out of it. And God supernaturally and miraculously gave them this bread to eat. And he said, this is what Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. So Jesus is comparing himself to the bread of heaven that is going to sustain them, but not just for a time period. This is for everlasting life. And so Jesus is the bread of life that was sent down from heaven. And these people here, they don't understand that because they saw where he grew up. They saw the family that he grew up with. They saw his brothers and sisters. They saw his mom and dad. But what they don't realize is all the miraculous things that happened for him to get to heaven. You know, born of the Virgin Mary, uh, born in Bethlehem. They didn't even know he was born in Bethlehem. So, because that's what the, where the Bible says that, that he would come from, that the, the Messiah would come from Bethlehem, and they thought he was from Nazareth. So, there's a lot of things that they didn't understand, but here's Jesus telling them, I'm the bread of life. Look at verse 33, it says, For the bread of God is he that cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto, the, unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, 
I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. And so what is Jesus saying here? He's the one that's going to be able to give you everlasting life. If you eat of him, then you're going to have everlasting life. If you're going to drink of him, you're never going to thirst. You know, he, these are themes that he goes over in John chapter 4. He tells the woman at the well, you know, if, if you would have known who it is that speaketh with thee, you know, that he was, you know, you, you would have asked of him and he would have given you, uh, ever, you know, life, let's see, the living water, right? That bubbleth up to everlasting life. So, verse 36, but I said unto you that ye also have seen me and believe not. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. So he just flat out tells him right here, I came down from heaven. You know, and if someone's standing in front of you telling you that, that might be a little hard for you to accept. I mean, I, I could see where they might feel like this is a hard thing to accept. But this is the word of God that's speaking to them right here. And it says, and this is the Father's will, which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. You see how he keeps repeating, you know, I'm going to give you everlasting life. I'm going to give you everlasting life. I'm going to raise you up at the last day. And he's telling them that he's the one that has the power to do this. Now look at what the Jews say. Verse 41, it says, Then the Jews murmured at him, because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. So they're thinking here that he's blaspheming. You know, they're murmuring against him. And they said, Is not this Jesus the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? See, they don't understand that he is from old, from everlasting, that he is God himself manifest in the flesh. And they don't understand this, and so this is a hard pill for them to swallow, that he came down from heaven. Look at verse 43. Jesus therefore answered and said unto him, Murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall, all, the, and they shall be all taught of God, every man therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father, cometh unto me. Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God, he hath seen the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. And this is, you know, the, the verse we, that Ryan put in the bulletin, and this is a great, powerful verse. It very simply tells you, all you have to do is believe in Jesus, and what do you have? Everlasting life. That's a, I mean, that is probably the most plain verse in the whole Bible to tell you if you just believe on Jesus, you got everlasting life. Very plain, very simple. What's the next thing he says? I am the bread of life. Your fathers did eat man in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. So the man in the wilderness, they ate that and those people died eventually, right? But Jesus is saying, if you eat of this bread, the bread of life, you're never going to die. You're going to have everlasting life. He said, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. What's he talking about? Well, he gave his body to be broken and beaten. And, and, you know, his face spit in and his beard ripped out and his face marred more than any man. And his precious blood was shed for us on the cross of Calvary. He gave his flesh. And that is the bread that we must partake of, the spiritual flesh, not the physical flesh that he's talking about. So because that, that physical flesh that he gave became a spiritual bread for us, if that makes sense to you. Verse 52 the Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So they're, they're thinking cannibalism, right? They don't get it. It's a hard pill for them to swallow. It says in verse 53, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath 
everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For is drink... Let me, uh, let's see, let me look at verse... I think I clipped some of this out. Yeah, 55. Oh, for my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. So this is a hard saying. I mean, if you don't understand what he's talking about here, it could sound like he's saying, hey, you gotta, you know, you gotta, you know, tear off a chunk and eat, right? But that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about a spiritual thing. And these people do not understand what he's talking about. It's a hard pill to swallow for them. Verse 58, this is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna, and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many therefore of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? And so that's why I picked this chapter, because many of the disciples that, that followed Jesus at this time, they, they, didn't, they didn't follow him anymore after this. We'll see that here when I go into those verses. But they said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? And so sometimes the Bible is going to say hard things to you. And you've and you got to just buckle up and take it. Yeah. You know, don't quit. Don't get upset. Don't get mad at God. Why don't you just try to understand that maybe your understanding isn't right and God's is. Amen. Good. So... Basically, they're saying right here, this is a hard pill, who can swallow it, right? When they say this is a hard saying, who can hear it? This is a hard pill, who can swallow this pill, right? And how should we respond to the hard sayings of the Bible? And like I said, just because it's hard doesn't mean you should quit. Just because it's hard doesn't mean you murmur against God and complain and be offended by it. Well, and, and, and why would you... You know, the thing is, when people get mad in church about things that the pastor says... Like things that I would say that you're just like, I can't, I can't believe he'd say that. You know, you're not really getting mad at me. You're getting mad at God. And so when they murmured against Jesus, who are they murmuring against? They're murmuring against God. And so God's sitting there trying to preach something to them that's very important, and they're just like, eh. And you know what murmuring is? Murmuring is when people are just like, you know, they're like, they're whispering things against you. And, you know, they don't believe what he's saying, and they're mad because of what he's saying, and so they're murmuring against him. Turn to Exodus chapter 15, verse 22. We'll see another example of where people murmured against God. They murmured against Moses, but really they're murmuring against God. Exodus chapter 15, verse 22. Now Moses is the man of God here. Look at what he says. He says, So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Marah. Now, sometimes that saying, you know, it's a, hard, it's a hard pill to swallow. Sometimes people, there's also a saying called it's a bitter pill to swallow. That means it's very unpleasant, but it must be accepted. Okay? So there's a difference between the hard pill to swallow and the bitter pill to swallow. The bitter pill is the one that's like, <sighs> have you ever taken medicine, like when you were a kid, it was like cough syrup or something that was really gross? Yeah. Like your mom had to put like sugar on it or something. You ever had that? I don't know, maybe I'm old. Maybe it's, it hasn't been like that <laughs> for you guys, but back in the old, have you ever heard that, sa that saying, take your medicine? Yeah. Because sometimes the medicine didn't taste very good, but it, it was supposed to help you feel better, right? So these people, it, it, they were bit, the water was bitter, and they couldn't drink it. Now look at what they said in verse 24. It says, And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them. So I, I find this verse very interesting because, you know, first of all, you know, God did help them and sustain them, but they, they, he also proved them at the waters, mm -hmm. right? He proved them to see what their attitude was going to be like, you know. So have you ever noticed a lot of times that they were mad because there wasn't water or there wasn't something that they wanted to eat? 
And they're just, they're just totally carnal people. Now, obviously, God, who, can, who broke them free from, from Egypt and took them out of slavery, you know, obviously, he didn't do it so he could kill them out in the wilderness. But that's what they thought. How about just ask God for what you need instead of getting mad? I think we're a lot like that sometimes. You know, we'll get mad when we don't have what we want or what we need. Instead of being mad about it, why don't you just ask God for it? You know, that's the difference between being thankful and being unthankful. Amen. Why didn't they just say, hey, Lord, we, we don't have any water. Can you provide us with some water? Mm -hmm. But instead they murmured against Moses and against, his, and against God's leadership. Because yeah. if you watch my sermon at all from Steadfast, I proved that the man of God in the Old Testament is Mo, was Moses. Right? God called him the man of God. In the New Testament, in, in First and Second Timothy, it calls Timothy a man, the man of God. Okay, so when you're murmuring against the man of God that's in charge in the congregation, you're not just murmuring against him; you're murmuring against God, because God is the one that put that man of God in leadership for you. So, but I find it interesting here that it says the Lord showed him a tree. Now, what did Jesus die upon? died upon the tree, right? The, the, the old rugged cross. But then when he cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. So it took Jesus dying upon that tree to make the waters of everlasting life sweet for us too, right? And, you know, he made that, uh, that a statute and an ordinance. Now, just real quickly, you know, there's statutes, there's ordinances, there's laws, right? An ordinance is something that pictures Christ in some way. And, and so this is a picture of Christ giving us everlasting life by dying upon the cross. There's a lot of spiritual things in the Old Testament that they didn't see, but now God has made it possible for us to see it because what are the ordinances that we do in this church? Anybody know? The Lord's Supper is one of them. And what's the other one? Is there any other one, laws in the, in the New Testament or any commandments in the New Testament that we're supposed to keep that picture the Lord Jesus Christ, death and burial? Or resurrection? Can you think of anything? Just think of something. So when people say there's more than two ordinances in the New Testament, that's not true. Because an ordinance pictures the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Or the body and blood of Christ in the, in the, you know, in the, in the elements, right? So why do, we, why do we still do that? Because it's a continuation of the Passover. You know, the Passover was something that was supposed to be done forever, Right? And so we continued that Passover when Christ changed it at the Lord's Supper and said, this do in remembrance of me. That's an ordinance that we're supposed to keep doing, right? So same thing with baptism. It represents the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. So what is this an ordinance of? Well, it's showing a tree, and that tree represents the cross. And that tree, when it's cast into the waters, what, what do we do what do we do when we go out into the world? We preach the cross, right? We preach Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection. And what do waters represent as far as God's concerned? What do you, what do you does anybody know? People and nations. The people and nations, right. So God, you, you put that cross into the world, you preach that cross into the, into the waters, the world, the people, then those waters become sweet. And they can drink up the Lord Jesus Christ, so to speak, and get everlasting life. You know, that's the well springing up into everlasting life. You drink of that, and you'll never thirst again. You eat of his body, you'll never be hungry again. You know why? Because we're going to have everlasting life. And you know what? There's fruit up in heaven that we can eat. New York steak fruit, right? I got, that's going to be my trees in my backyard, right? New York steak, you know. Anyway, I'm just kidding. It probably won't be. I'll be disappointed, but I'll probably not really be disappointed. Probably be actually pretty happy. So, but anyway, so look, he murmurs against, they murmur against Moses, and then, you know, it shows us that picture, that ordinance. That was just kind of like a little freebie to throw in there, but, you know, when people are saying that there's no, that there's other ordinances, and that, you know, the Lord's Supper, you know, and all this other stuff, look, we, we do this in the church. We do those things in the church because who, who was the one in the Old Testament that, that did the Passover for people? Was it the priest? Yeah, did they have to wash themselves and make themselves clean? Yeah, they did. So why would we think that we don't have to wash ourselves and make ourselves clean? 
you know, we're still sinners. We're still, you know, we're worthy. But hey, if you're, if someone's coming in here and they're committing adultery against their wife, do you think that they should partake of the Lord's Supper? No, no because they're not discerning the body and blood of Christ. And when he says, when you therefore come together, tarry one for another, why are we tarrying for one another? Who's he talking to in that, in that chapter? Who's he talking to in 1 Corinthians chapter 11? Church. He's talking to the church. How is it that we, the, that we think that they're talking to somebody else? Yeah. It's not, the unworthy is not the people that are lost. The un unworthy are the people that need to get right with God before they partake. And look, in that chapter also, it's, you know, it's clearly talking to people in the church. Okay? Paul's telling them how to do it, how they're doing it wrong. Then he tells them how the Lord Jesus did it and tells them how to correct themselves and do it right. I mean, I think it's very plain. I think it's very simple. And I don't see any other ordinances that picture the death and burial and resurrection or the body and blood of Christ in the New Testament that we're supposed to keep. So you know why we believe in two ordinances here? Because that's all that's in the New Testament. That's all the ones that picture the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, people can get mad about that all they want, but it's just the truth. So, anyway, uh, let's look at verse 26. It says, And said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. So, what's God saying here? Hey, why don't you just keep diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God? What were these people, what were these Pharisees in John chapter 6 guilty of? Not hearkening to the voice. What were the disciples that left him guilty of? Not hearkening to the voice of the Lord. Not keeping his, you know, it says, and do that which was right in his sight, and will give ear to the commandments, and keep all his statutes. I will put none of these diseases upon you. You know, the thing is, we got to understand that even though things might be a hard pill to swallow, look, God expects us to keep them. And it's not, it's not just because he wants to lord over us everything. It's because he wants to help us. He wants to help our lives because what happens if we don't? Well, the diseases are going to come upon us. People want to, don't understand why they're sick and why they're hurting and why all this stuff. Hey, a lot of it's because of our own fault. A lot of it's because we played too much football. You know, you're going to reap what you sow. And hey, if you're reaping, smashing into people over and over and over again all the time, if you're sowing all that all the time, guess what you're going to reap later? You're going to reap the pain from it, yeah. right? If you're constantly playing basketball and you're breaking your ankle all the time, you know, what are you going to reap when you're older? Some sore ankles. If you play racquetball, I played racquetball for about three years straight. And you know what it gave me? Tendonitis in my elbow. So I can't even play anymore at all. Like if I, <laughs> if I played for like more than a couple days, I, my elbow would be right back where it was. You know, we reap what we sow. The things that we do in our bodies, we will, you know, receive, you know, recompense for those things. And sometimes it's not even doing a bad thing. It's just, it's just the way things work, right? But we need to make sure that we're ready to swallow the pill of God's word and let it do what it's supposed to do. You know, his word and his commandments are going to be like a medicine to us. It says, I am the Lord that healeth thee. You know, you want to be healed? Well, why don't you start keeping God's commandments? Why don't you start doing what he says? Why don't you start listening with your ears and, uh, you know, taking it into your heart? What he's saying and quit looking at everything like it's, you know, a physical thing and look at the spiritual aspects of this book. And that bitter, bitter pill to swallow, it might be unpleasant, but it must be accepted. It must be accepted. And, you know, don't murmur against God when things aren't going your way. Job didn't murmur against God when things weren't going his way. That's a, that's a great example to look at. Christ didn't murmur against God when he was going through everything. He said, not my will, Lord, but thy will. You know, he wanted the cup, you know, say, if it's possible to take this cup away from me, but he knew it wasn't. He just said, but if it is, you know, do you think Christ wanted to go through that for us? He didn't really want to endure that pain, but he did because it was the will of the Father. Amen. And he knew that's the only way that he could save the whole world. Turn to Hebrews chapter 6.
Actually, you know what? Skip Hebrews chapter 6. Let's just go back to John 6. John 6, 61. So how do we swallow the hard pills in God's word? Well, we must accept and hear and obey him even if we don't fully understand. We're not always going to fully understand what he wants. We're not, it's not always going to sit right with us. There's some things in this book that I have a hard time with. But you know what? You've got to swallow that pill. You've got to accept it. It might not make sense to you. But you do, you still got to accept it and believe it. Why? Because God's not going to lie. And he's going to try to give you what you need. He's going to give you the things that you need. This book will equip you in everything you need for your whole life. Well, what about the book of Enoch? Nuts to the book of Enoch. It's not even scripture. It talks about 450 foot tall giants. I saw this guy, po this guy posted like these this meme of all these different giants from these different giant tribes, they made them look like these like trolls from like a, a science fiction. It's like, he's like, and the, and the, and the, and the giants are going to be coming back soon. Hello? The giants are here still. They've never been gone. They've always been here. But see, they think it's from the Nephilim. But they don't want it. That's a hard pill for them to swallow. Well, they weren't 450 tall, foot tall. Well, look at the skeletons that they find. It's an internet hoax, people. Yeah. It's not true. John 6, 61. When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured, that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, doth this offend you? What are we talking about? That he said, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. The disciples murmured at it. It wasn't just the Pharisees, it was the disciples too. And see, that's the thing, is that Christians can do the same thing and be murmuring at the things that God is trying to show us. They can murmur and say, I, I'm offended. I can't believe he would say that. I can't believe he'd say that women should be wearing pants. Well, you know, God says it's an abomination. If I went home and put a dress on right now after the service, wouldn't you think I'm a freak? Huh? Wouldn't you call me an abomination? Pastor Thompson is an abomination. He went home and put a dress on. And rightly so. So how is it that you wear a dress to church and then you're going to go home and put your pants on? Like a big boy. You know what I'm saying? It's, that's a hard pill for women to swallow. Why? Because the culture has dictated what we do. But look, the Word of God says something different, and that's what we need to follow. It's a hard pill to swallow. Take a big drink. And just take in God's word for what it says. So um, he said, does this offend you? In verse 62 it says, and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before. What? And if you see the Son of Man ascend up from where he was before. So he's saying, hey, what are you going to do if you see me go up into heaven like I was before? You know, because what, did they see him go back into heaven? Yes, they did. His disciples did see him go up into heaven. So just because they didn't see him come down from heaven doesn't mean anything. It's still true. Whether they want to believe that or not, whether it's a hard pill for him to swallow or not, Jesus did come down from heaven. He was born in Bethlehem's manger. He was born of the Virgin Mary, and he, his father was God. It wasn't a human father. He was, had a, he, his father was God. So, but they didn't see that. How could they see that? Look at verse 63, it says, It is the Spirit that quickeneth. This is, this is really important. You've got to catch this right here. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. It's the words that he speaks that are spirit and are life. So what, what, what words was he trying to tell them? Spiritually, you have to eat my flesh. Spiritually, you have to drink my blood. Because he was going to give his life for a sacrifice. He was a sinless, the sinless lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. He was speaking spiritually. But to them it was a hard saying because they were looking at it physically. He's trying to get us to be accountable. That's not what he was saying. Look at verse 64. But there are some of you that believe not, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not, and who should betray him. Therefore I said unto you that no man can come unto me except that were given to him of my father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked 
no more with him. So isn't it funny that he tries to explain right here, hey, take it easy. The words I'm speaking to you are spirit and they're life. And then his disciples that were following him, it doesn't say they weren't saved. They were like, see you later. This, is too, this was too hard. They choked on the pill. They couldn't accept it. They couldn't receive it. And so what? They walked away. And I'll tell you what, a lot of people have come to this church and they've walked away. A lot of people have come to this church and they were coming to this church and they walked away. Why? Because they couldn't receive the things of the Word of God that were too hard for them. It's too hard of a pill to swallow. But, you know, you're going to do good if you drink, if you take your medicine. The medicine of God's Word, if you let that medicine get down there, if you, if you get that hard pill swallowed, you're going to be in good shape. So it says that many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Then Jesus said to the twelve, Will you also go away? Will you also go away? Then Simon, this is where Peter says something good for once. He usually is saying something wrong. No, not all the time, but he, he has his moments where he doesn't do so well. But this is a great moment where Peter says the truth. He said, Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Hey, and that's something that you should tell yourself if you ever think about quitting. I'm not saying you have to stay at this church. I'm not saying, look, you should go to whatever church you feel like you should go to. But I'm saying this, that at least go to a good church. Yeah. At least go to a church where they're preaching the truth. Mm -hmm. And, you know, good luck. Good luck finding one around here. So, you know, I, you know unfortunately, we're the only game in town right now. There might be a couple okay churches around here, but... They're not, they're not preaching stuff like this. They're not preaching this. They're preaching grace, chap, you know, part 33. <laughs> how to walk in grace. How to live in grace. How to be graceful. You know, it's just like, that's all they talk about is sweetness and light all the time, and they never give people the hard truths that they need to hear. They never give them the, the big pill. They give them the baby pills that dissolve, that taste like candy or whatever. The Flintstone vitamins, that's what they give them. Here, chew these up really nicely before you swallow them. They taste great. Who's ever had Flintstone vitamins that taste like candy? You're like, I'm going to eat all these things. <laughs> I go, oh, mommy, my tummy hurts. <laughs> yeah, you ate all the Flintstone vitamins, dummy. <laughs> anyway. But, you know, <laughs> you're going to get, if you go to other, and I'm not just saying this is the only good church ever, but... Look, we're trying to give you a balanced diet here. We're trying to help you with things. And look, in the New Testament, you know, rebuke, rep reprove, rebuke, exhort. Two things are negative. One thing is positive. I'm going to try to give you, you know, one third positive. But we're in a negative world right now. Hey, we need a lot of negativity to help us be positive. You know, positive, negative, negative, uh, you know, who, who, who's the engineers here? <laughs> With batteries, you have to have a positive and a negative, don't you? <clears throat> so, you know, if, if you don't, then it's not gonna, the, the machine's not going to work right. So, but we need to get a little negativity in us. You know, God's Word can be negative toward you. But it's just to help you. It's just to kick you in the spiritual pants, right, and make you, and make you do right. Because we're like sheep going astray. We've turned everyone to his own way, Right? Every, every sheep likes to go off and go to a different pasture. You know, why do they have to have shepherds? Because they're sheep. And they just kind of wander off sometimes. You know, and we need to understand that we're like that. And that we need to get spiritually slapped around every once in a while. The, the, the shepherd's going to have to smack you with the crook every once in a while. And get you back in line. Get you back in with the rest of the sheep. And, you know, that's... Sometimes it's hard being negative. I want to be positive, but you need negative. I like giving positive too, though. Who wants some positive af affirmation right now? I'm so glad you guys are here in church this morning. It's so gl great to see your faces. There you go. There's your positive part. So, but what did Peter say? He said, thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Hey, are you sure about that this morning? If you are then we should have our ears open to what he has to say to us, even if it's a hard saying. So what are some other hard sayings? Well, 
the earth isn't billions of years old. That's a hard saying for people, isn't it? I'm just going to kind of go off on some stuff right now. The earth isn't billions of years old. You say that to someone, what do they do? That's a hard pill to swallow. They have a hard time with that one, don't they? But the Bible says in Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Okay? And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Hey, who created the heaven and the earth? God did. It wasn't a big bang that happened 4.6 billion years ago, or whatever they say it is. It's probably more than that now, 14.6, I don't know. They change the times all the time. You know, they're sitting there saying that they've seen a black hole swallow up a star and burped out all this cosmic stardust or whatever. Look, that's a bunch of garbage. Amen. They didn't see that. I don't believe that for one second. Amen. You know what they try to put our eyes in the stars for? So we'll get our eyes off this book. Right. Hey, I like to look up the stars and see God's creation, but that's what I look at it at. Like, look, that's beautiful what God created. That's great. But my, you know, they want us to think about there's aliens on other planets. Right. Why? Because they want to get us off of this book and into some science fiction theater. Right. Star Trek, Star Wars, all this other stuff. It's, inter it's, you know, it's cool to, to whatever, you know, think about those things every once in a while, but look, people ask me questions like, well, do you think there's life on other planets? I don't think there's life on this planet sometimes. <laughs> but the thing is, is, you know, look, God created the heaven and the earth. It's not billions of years old. It's only 6,000 and change. And, you know, that's a hard pill for people to swallow, but it's just the truth. So Romans 1 says, For the wrath of God, and you can turn there if you want, Romans 1.18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in, right, in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. See, God has shown us the creation. He's shown us, all you have to do is just peek your head outside the door and see the creation. Okay, you can see the trees. Look, that stuff doesn't make itself. Trees are beautiful. Mountains are beautiful. I was flying in an airplane over and, and flew right next to Mount Hood. You know what, that's beautiful. And you know who didn't make it? Some explosion trillions of years ago or whatever. You know, you know what explosions do? They blow things up. They don't create life. So it says in verse 20, for the visible things from him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Hey, you know what? You're not going to walk in this building and go, wow, this is pretty cool. That explosion created this building like that. <laughs> if you think that, you're, you're committing intellectual suicide. Anybody that thinks that a Big Bang produced everything that we see here is insane. Well, they just don't want to believe God. They just don't love, they don't like God. Right. So that I had some lady email me last night. It was probably from Eugene. I don't know where she was from, but <laughs> she was like, I'm all for this, the First Amendment and this and this and that, but your useless destruction of trees to, to, to print your papers that you put on my door is offensive to Mother Earth and blah, 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 blah. And I was just like, well, obviously you hate God. Hey, why don't you send me your address and then I'll take you off the list of people that want, you know, she never emailed me back. But it says, obviously you just hate God. Yeah. I said, we don't, we don't worship the trees, we worship the God that made them. Amen. So, look, she's without excuse the Bible says, For the invisible things from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. So they are without excuse. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And this is the problem with science. Hey, science is good as long as it lines up with God's word. If it doesn't line up with God's word, then it's not science. Because God, you know, guess what? This might blow your mind. This might be a hard pill to swallow. But God made science. So I don't understand. You know, I guess I understand people that don't believe in God. They'll, they'll, they, work, they basically worship science. You know, but some of their science is faulty. Anyway, moving on. Noah's Ark. Here's another thing that people find a hard pill to swallow. This is where atheists will always go and try to say, well, how did all those animals fit on the ark? 
You know, people just don't have any kind of brain power to, to figure out that maybe they didn't bring the biggest animals on the ark that they could. They didn't bring the biggest bull elephant uh, that they could onto the ark. They probably brought baby ones on, right? And T-Rex was probably P-Rex. You know, he was a little guy. So, but the Bible says in Genesis chapter 7, verse 1, it says, And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens, the male and his female. So they're apparently married. And of beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his female. Of fowls also of the air by sevens, the male and the female, to keep seed alive upon the face of all the earth. Hey, look, God said, this is God speaking to Noah, saying, bring these animals into the ark. So, can God lie? No. It's an immutable fact that God can't lie. That means it's an unchanging fact. God can't lie. What did he say? Bring these animals onto the ark. So, every single living creature, by their species or whatever, he brought two um, and seven of each clean kind. It says, For yet seven days I will cause it to rain upon the earth, verse 4, upon the earth forty days and forty nights, and every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. And Noah did according to all the Lord commanded him. See, it wasn't a hard pill for Noah to swallow. That's why he picked him. Because Noah kept his commandment and did what he said. He said, go build that ark. And he did it by faith. He preached for 120 years, trying to get people saved. And then, you know, the, the waters came and killed everybody. But Noah listened. And people think that that's, not, that's a hard pill to swallow, that all those, ar those animals fit on the ark. Well, it is unless you don't, it is if you don't believe God's word. How about miracles in the Bible? Well, in our story, we saw two miracles happen, right? The feeding of the 5,000, what was the other one? Uh, yeah, the, the, him calming the sea and transporting that ship to the other side. And it wasn't just, you know, it, it warped over to the other side, right? Like Star Trek. But anyway, but it was a, it's a miracle. We're talking about miracles that Christ did. The Bible is filled with miracles. And the thing is, if you don't believe the miracles, then you don't believe God. And there's people that say, well, I believe the Bible. I just don't believe the miracles of the Bible. I don't believe that there's angels like the Sadducees. They didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in the miracles. And that's why they were sad, you see. But the miracles, well, here's, here's one miracle. Jonah, Jonah chapter 1. Turn to Jonah chapter 1. There's one that, that people scoff at all the time. And this miracle um, is something that Jesus backed up in the New Testament. Jonah chapter 1, verse 7, it says, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights, which of course represented the fact that Jesus was in the, in the belly of hell for three days and three nights. That's why the whale pictures, the, the belly of the whale pictures hell. But it says a fish, right? So, you know, the NIV will, will interpret that as sea monster or sea serpent. And other Bibles will say, this literally means sea serpent. Like if you see it, the little footnote at the bottom. But what does Jesus say in, in well, well, let's look, actually turn over to Jonah chapter 2, verse 10, just one, one page over. Jonah 2, 10, it says, And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. So they'll say, well, that's impossible for a person to live three days and three nights in the belly of a fish. Well, you know, that might be a hard pill for you to swallow, but the fact is the Bible says it, so that makes it true. Amen. God's word is what is true. It's not what your opinion is. Right. And I don't need somebody to say, well, it is physically possible because if in science, you know, if you, it is possible to, you know. Look, I don't care about your science. It was a miracle. And well, I don't need science from what animals can do, what they can't do, and how long some human can fit in the belly of a whale. All I need to know is God said it, and I believe it. That's it. Look at Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. Matthew 12, verse 40. Matthew chapter 12, verse 40 says, For as Jonas was three days and three nights in what? The whale's belly. So shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. 
So Jesus backed up the story of Noah, or I mean of uh, Jonah, and said, "Hey, this is this is a true statement." So we have the Old Testament story of it, and we also have Jesus backing it up and even saying it was three days and three nights, and also calling it a whale. In the book of Jonah, it calls it a fish. So I guess God considers whales fish. But people go, well, they're mammals. They're still fish. They swim in the sea. They're still fish. They swim in the ocean. You can call it whatever scientific name you want, but Jesus said it was a whale. And in the book of Jonah, it said it was a fish. So whales are fish. There you go. Bibles, that's a hard pill for some people to swallow. They're mammals. They're fish. God said they were fish. So shut your mouth. Anyway, the virgin birth. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Isaiah 7, I'm trying to buzz saw through these because I know I'm running out of time. The virgin birth is a hard pill for people to swallow. The virgin birth. So, and people make fun of the virgin birth, like unbelievers and things like that. It really ticks me off. But the NIV will call it a young, what does it call her, a young girl or something? Yeah. You know, because they, they want to take away from the deity of Christ and say, the young maiden is what they'll say in the modern versions. No, the Bible says she was a virgin. That means she never been with a man before. Isaiah 7, 14 says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which, of course, we know what does that mean. Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. Matthew 1, verse 23 says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So who was Jesus? God with us. Hey, who was his father? God. He was called the Son of God. If you don't believe the virgin birth, you're not even saved. Yeah. Just tell you that right now. You're like, well, it's a hard pill for me to swallow. Well, you better get saved. <laughs> and then maybe you'll believe it. Gender roles. Genesis 127. I'm going to power through these two. I'll have you turn to Matthew chapter 19, verse 4. Genesis 127. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, right? So God created man in his own image, man. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Here's another pill that's hard for people to swallow. The, the women are not made in the image of God. Man is. And people get mad about that. But it's just the truth. So that's what it Does it say? It says in the name, let's see. It says in the image of God created he him. God's not a woman. God is a man. God is a masculine character. It's not, you know, if you're taught, if you try to say that God, you know, try to use a, uh, you know, a gender neutral pronoun for God, then you're blaspheming. It says male and female created he them. So it's just saying that he created, you know, where, where was, how did Eve get formed? From Adam's rib. How did Adam get formed? From the dust of the earth. Okay, we're made out of dirt, so don't get mad, ladies. You're made out of a rib. It's okay. But look at verse, uh, you're in Matthew chapter 19, verse 4. Hank, I'll, I'll read you Genesis chapter 5, 2 real quick. It says, Male and female created he them, and blessed them, and called their name Adam in the day that they were created. Matthew 19, verse 4 says, And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? Why is gender role such a hard pill for people to swallow? The Bible says he created them male and female. It wasn't H I J K L M N O P Q R S T U V all these different letters after their after their name. There's just one. There's just two types of people: male and female. There's no other genders. These are other genders are made up genders. Okay, it's not real. It's fake. And it's a hard pill for people to swallow because we're we got this filth pushed in our face all the time. What else do I got here? Teetotalers. Teetotalers. People, you know, what a, a teetotaler isn't someone that drinks tea, okay? A teetotaler is someone is a person that abstains totally from intoxicating drink. So at this church, I preach tea, the teetotaler lifestyle. Hey, I don't believe it's okay to drink. I don't believe it's okay to be drunken. Why do I not believe that? Well, in Proverbs 23, verse 31, it says, Look not thou upon the wine when it's red, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. 
At the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women and thy heart shall utter perverse things. Hey, you want to be a pervert? You want to be some, uh, you want to be like you're bitten by a snake? You want to get in fights with people and not know how you got your bruises and your, and your wounds? Well, keep looking upon the line. Keep drinking it and getting drunk, you drunkard. And your, your drunkenness is going to destroy you. Why do I preach abstinence? Because abstinence is the only way to not destroy your family through alcohol and drugs. Alcohol and drugs will destroy your life. And I'm going to preach against that till the, till the day I die. Amen. I'm never going to go back on that. That's good. The Bible commands us to be sober as believers. It commands everybody to be sober. Yep. But as a believer, we should be sober. Amen. I believe God killed Nadab and Abihu because they were drunk when they walked in uh, to the temple. And they offered strange fire to the Lord. Yeah. Because right afterwards, it starts saying... That, you know, none of, the, none of the priests are supposed to drink alcohol and go into God's house. Yeah. You know why we kick drunk people out of here if they come in? Because we're not supposed to let drunks into the church. Amen. That's why. 1 Thessalonians 5, 6 says, Therefore let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. 1 Thessalonians 5, 8. But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. Titus 2, 2. That the aged men be sober. Grave, temperate, sound in faith and in charity and patience. Titus 2.4, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded, Titus 2.6. 1 Peter 1.13, wherefore gird up the loins of your mind and be sober and hope to the end of the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of of Jesus Christ. Look, the Bible commands us to be sober. Is there any doubt about that? It says not to look at wine, not to look at alcohol. I'll tell you what, people think I'm crazy for this and I don't care. I don't walk down the alcohol and liquor aisles at the stores. If I accidentally bump into it, I'm like, oh man. You know why? Because I don't, I'm not supposed to look at it. Why are you not supposed to look at it? Because you don't want to be tempted by that devil's brew, that juice of the devil. Look, it never has anything good to say about alcohol in the Bible. And I don't care if you think Jesus turned water into alcoholic wine. That is idiotic. Yeah, like he just said, let's keep the party going, guys. I'm just going to get you more drunk. They weren't drunk. They were drinking grape juice. Grape juice was a commodity in, the old, yeah. in, in old times that was hard to come by. Right. You know, grapes are expensive. They're not cheap. And if people were drinking alcohol, always bad things were happening to them. It's, you know, be drunken and spew, he was telling his pre... They're people that, that did give in to that sin, they, God said be drunken and spew. Puke all over your tables, you disgusting freaks. Look, he doesn't want us doing that. And as a Christian, we're kings and priests unto God, and we shouldn't be partaking in alcohol. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, be sober. That's the first thing it says. Why? Well, go look at all these drunk and, and heroin junkies Downtown, well, you just can look out the door, actually. But look outside and go see what they're doing. You know why you need to be sober? It says be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. You know how the first thing he gets into your life? By getting in through alcohol and drugs. How does he, get, how does he start to possess people? By getting them to do alcohol and drugs and getting into sorcery. That's what sorcery is. Out pharmaceuticals and alcohol and things like that. That's how he gets a foothold in your life, and then he can just take you at captive at his will. So I have other stuff here, but I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to close here. But um, look, there's lots of hard pills to swallow. How about friends being friends with the world? Well, Jesus was friends with sinners, yeah, he was, but he was trying to get him saved. How about family is less important than God? That's a hard pill to swallow. Go to the pool party, go to church. Go to the birthday party, go to church. Hey, why don't you just quit planning stuff on Sunday and I'll come. How about that? Um, but people, those are hard pills for people to swallow. Homos can't be saved. That's a hard pill to swallow. Because look, 99.9% .9 of all Christianity is preaching that junk now, including Baptists. But, you know, it's a hard pill to swallow, but I'll tell you what, the Bible says that he's given them over to a reprobate mind. And if he's given them over to a reprobate mind, that means he's done. He done gave up. 
I heard somebody say that, that uh, a pastor was preaching the reprobate doctrine and he preached that there's three stages of the reprobate. God gave them over, God gave them up, God gave them up to a reprobate mind. So there's like, they get the three, three strikes, you're out, or something like that. No, he's just trying to repeat the fact that he said they're given over. Hey, let me ask you this. If your kid goes, or just say you have a friend in your life, and they go bad, and you just say, you know what? I've given up on trying to be friends with them. I just cannot be friends with them anymore. You've given up. Does that mean you're friends with them anymore? You've given up your friendship. How about if you're running in a race, and you stop and take a break, and you're like, okay, I'm done. My legs are cramped. It's over. I've given up. What does that mean? You're done. When God says he's given up on someone, that means they're done. When he's given them over, it's over. Done and over with, right? So why is it so hard for Christians to understand that God's given them over to a reprobate mind? It's a hard pill for people to swallow because we're being brainwashed daily by the media and the news and all that garbage that is just clouding people's mind. It's clouding people's judgment. But I'll tell you what, we need to get on God's program. We need to take God's medicine and God's pills, right? The, the Bible, the Holy Word of God. So I have more stuff here, but I'm definitely out of time now. But uh, anyway, hopefully uh, that helped you. And uh, we can uh, you know, just apply this to our lives. Hey, some things in God's Word are hard, hard pill to swallow. Divorce and remarriage. What, what Jesus taught, that's a hard pill for people to swallow. But you know what? You need to swallow that pill. And you need to keep God's Word and just believe what He says. And don't get mixed up with what other people are telling you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this wonderful day. We pray that you bless uh, the soul winning today and the second service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.